And with that, I'd like to say welcome. Uh, you may not realize it, but this time is blown. Uh, but this month's Gene Mock meeting is actually, the, it's been a full year since we started this thing. Uh, so let's, yeah, round of applause for all of you. So it's pretty exciting how uh, the club has grown so much we've needed to have a new room. Uh, we have a lot of exciting things also planned for the rest of the academic year, which I'll share uh, at the end of the newsreel. Um, all right, so, and this is the projector where red doesn't work, as we all know. <laughs> for pencil. All right, uh, so for example, you wouldn't see these mosquitoes are in red. Uh, <laughs> all right, so uh, one exciting thing is that the UN Convention on Biodiversity uh, met just last month, and they rejected uh, a moratorium that was proposed, a global moratorium on gene drive technology, and so that allows research uh, on this to continue. Uh, so while individual countries can propose whatever regulations they wish, the TLDR version is that nothing's changed, still in the status quo, wait and see period for gene drive technology. All right. Uh, on the alphabet soup of DNA, uh, there's been some uh, attempt orthogonal to a lot of the novel amino acid incorporation work going on here to incorporate unnatural base pairing. Uh, and create these semi-synthetic organisms that have DNA with more than four letters. And the idea here is increased information storage potential. So if you have four bases, uh, moving on to six, that actually creates this combinatorial explosion in the amount of things you could potentially encode. And so previously in 2014, what this group did is they added two new bases to E. coli. Uh, and so this is the regular CG pairing, this is the modified one, and they found it was somewhat toxic to the cell, so incorporated in their genome. Um, and additionally, even for those cells that did survive, because they grew slower, eventually they were outcompeted in the population that didn't, didn't make it through. Uh, so this time around, they made a few modifications. They changed one of the unnatural base pairs to this one. This is pairs better. They used Cas9 to eliminate any DNA that doesn't maintain this. So it's basically selecting for the population as a whole to maintain this base pair. And it's, they claim that it is a stable and autonomous, autonomous uh, semi-synthetic organism. Um, so, I don't know how many of these they incorporated, to what extent you know, is incorporating one base pair in a genome semi-synthetic. Still a cool discussion, though. All right. uh, on to eukaryotes. A lot of people might be here familiar with Martin Schwarzenegger's work. A lot of uh, theranostics, uh, cell-based therapy, so the notion of uh, taking a genetically engineered cell, implanting it in a mouse or potentially human, and having the cell both uh, sense and then uh, therapeutically act upon uh, some disease state. And one of their big uh, pushes is diabetes. And so this is almost half a billion people globally. It results in elevated blood glucose. And in type 1 diabetes, this is specifically due to the inability uh, to have insulin-producing beta cells that work well. So the current treatment strategy is typically to just take shots of insulin. And what they did here is they engineered these cells. They don't travel throughout your body, but rather just sit in an implant and they're able to sense the elevated glucose levels. And by coupling this uh, transport of high glucose outside the cell to inside the cell, uh, it's coupled with this mechanism of depolarizing the membrane. And then through a calcium influx in this whole calmodulin pathway, it leads to the secretion of insulin. And so they implanted these in mice. It worked pretty well. And they claim it's a closed loop, dose-dependent uh, theranostic. And it seems like this is the fifth time they've shown a cure for diabetes. But this one seems the most impressive. Um, <laughs> I, I joke. It's very cool. All right. uh, we're going to hear a lot more from Albert today uh, on Cas9 from the, the legal and patent side. Uh, but on the, on the web lab side, there's been a couple papers recently, and this is one of them, trying to identify these native inhibitor proteins, or antiproteins. And uh, what happens is that these are encoded in prophages, and they prevent the Cas9 from binding and editing DNA. And the researchers found that they can take these phages, it works well in bacteria, it works well in humans. And so it's kind of crazy when you think about this evolutionary arms race, because it was the phages that are trying to attack the bacteria, and the bacteria that came up with CRISPR, and then the phages that said, aha, anti-CRISPR. So maybe there's an anti-anti-CRISPR waiting to be discovered out there. <laughs> if anyone's into bioinformatics, you should start mining genomes right now and uh, get the next big thing. All right, uh, so this is on the uh, DIY bio side. Um, very cool um, paper uh, on how to implement uh, 
low-cost diagnostic more effectively. So if anyone's worked with a centrifuge, probably everyone in this room, you know it's big, it's expensive, it breaks often. If Devin is here, she knows that the ultra centrifuge breaks every day. Um, and so what this means is that if you want to use a centrifuge for anything in a resource limited nation, it's essentially uh, impractical, too expensive, and so forth. So what uh, this paper did is they created this paper cube. I kid you not, it's made of paper and string. It works as a centrifuge. It's 20 cents to make, it weighs two grams. Uh, it's based on an ancient toy from thousands of years ago. Uh, and it spins up to 30,000 G. And based on some biophysical calculations of the torque and so forth, they estimate the theoretical max is one million RPM. And so you can kind of imagine how this works. Just two little pieces of paper here connected by a string. Here are the tubes of the blood samples. And what you do is you unwind and you wind it by essentially pulling the string and just pulling it back and forth. And the, the different circles fit. So they can isolate plasma from blood in 90 seconds. They can isolate malaria parasites in 15 minutes. Uh, take that $100,000 machine. Uh, what lab are they from? Like where? Uh, this is a uh, Stanford lab. <laughs> They're the same people who made the $1 microscope, the paper microscope. Oh, wow. Then cool. the, the centrifuge and the microscope can be buddies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, on the, so a general design build test goal in synthetic biology um, involves trying to go through this cycle in a way that can be scaled up without making mistakes. Uh, and so one problem that anyone who's ordered a gene before from a synthesis company recognizes is that not every sequence that you design can be manufactured. There are limitations, there are constraints on the synthesis technology and so forth. But a lot of design tools really don't factor these in. Uh, so this is an ACS Symbio paper that develops uh, Boost, uh, which if you notice, uh, does actually not correspond to what it stands for, but it's close enough. Uh, <laughs> they're like false. Uh, but it, what it does is it just incorporates these uh, determinants into the process. So we have this juggler, which uh, juggles codon optimization. This polisher, uh, which unites the codon optimization with uh, sequence constraints. And then partitioner, which divvies it up on plasmids to synthesize. So you can stitch it all back together when you've executed the lab. Uh, so I was more impressed with the creative naming. Um, yeah. Still very cool stuff. On the industry side, uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, which was founded just under 10 years ago uh, by Tom Knight, uh, they've just acquired Gen9. And so along with this, they've also doubled their facility size. Uh, and what this really will allow this, the organism company to do, is have vertical integration. Because if their products from this company are they want to design uh, valuable stuff uh, by fermentation, improve strains, and so forth, now with Gen9 under the belt, they can just vertically integrate the custom gene synthesis. So if they want to create a new organism, great. They don't have to order the DNA from someone else. They can do it start to finish. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think we'll see a lot more coming out of this um, soon. This is pretty exciting. Uh, from here, rather than highlight a single article from a CSB lab, I thought I would just showcase in the past month, these are a handful of articles that were just published from CSB Labs here. So it's more of a kudos to everyone in this room. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and for upcoming events, for Gene Mods, uh, things to stay tuned for. If you're looking for an audience for any purpose, to give a practice talk for a conference and so forth, there are many ways we can really utilize this listservs. So just contact uh, uh, Sarah, Isaac Weston, or myself if you want to get the word out for something. Additionally, we're looking to host a panel discussion in a few months. Um, and we have a potential organizer for this, and it's going to be on a hot symbiotic topic. We don't know which one yet, but we're hoping to invite uh, both you all, as well as a broader public, to engage in some interesting discussion. So probably in the spring quarter, that's when it will happen. Also, something to look forward to, a professional development trip. Uh, still in the works, maybe a field trip to a company like Lancetech. If you have ideas or suggestions or, or contacts, please definitely let us know as well. We'll incorporate that. And then also, uh, as I said, it's been a full year. It's a great tenure, but at a certain point, we all have to pass the baton. So if you're interested in getting involved in any way, uh, please come see us. Another uh, thing to look out for, regardless of whether we make this a gene mods activity, is there's this uh, Illinois Biotech Innovation Organization, or IBI. Uh, once again, the acronyms work out nicely. And they hold an annual life sciences industry expo 
downtown in Chicago. It's every April. It's a really good networking event. Um, and so if you're interested in meeting representatives from literally hundreds of companies in the Midwest, this is hands down uh, the largest event, and it should be pretty exciting. Uh, so you can check out more info I bio that work. I was debating whether to include this last slide, but in the end I decided to just go ahead and do it. Uh, and I thought I would mention that we live in unsettled times. Uh, if anyone's been checking Google News or their feed or whatever it is, you know that there's a lot going on in our nation, uh, and this impacts our science as well. And so it's potentially useful to step back and zoom out and think about um, what is our national science policy, uh, if you think we even have one, and to what extent does it meet our goals. And there's been a lot of uh, questions recently about uh, how certain uh, departments will continue and move forward in the ways they have in the past, but I would argue that these questions are no different than um, fundamentally what we would ask ourselves in any other year. Um, these are always important questions to ask. What is our science policy? How do we support science and advocate for it? Um, and so, um, along these lines, I would like everyone just to, just to, on their own time, consider how should researchers, and really fellow citizens, and anyone really advocate for science in terms of uh, specific government policies they believe in. Uh, it sounds simple, but the recognition of, of facts that are established is need to be um, communicated effectively to the public and for the duty and for the right, essentially, to uh, engage with the public in all these ways. And this covers many issues, climate, environment, energy, vaccines, medicine, you name it. I think everyone has an important stake in this. Uh, and so along these lines, something that is starting up potentially orthogonal to GMODs is a policy-based group. Um, and we'll have more info coming on this soon, um, but its goal is uh, to essentially get discussions on policy going and help us think about, um, we're all trained in research, uh, let's, let's flex a different set of, of ideas about how to make an impact in a different sphere. All right. So that's, that's all I have for the newsreel, uh, some food for thought, and up next is Albert to talk about CRISPR-Cas patent stuff.